Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to the first ever AnyKey Inclusion 101 live stream. Um, I'm excited to see a bunch of uh, friendly names in chat um, and hoping we can have some fun. Thank you for being so uh, hype, Roulette. So before we get going today, I just want to uh, kick off with, oops, sorry, hey. I just want to kick off with a uh, land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm coming to you broadcasting from the lands of the Mohegan and Pequot, my ancestors, um, and I just want to thank them for uh, stewarding this land for generations and generations. So with my respects paid, I also want to uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, thank you very much to the Air Force for uh, supporting the production of this stream, and also thank you very much to Intel for supporting all of the research that went into Inclusion 101. So uh, today we're here to um, get some training about practical ways to increase inclusion. So uh, I think probably uh, a lot of you showed up today because uh, you know that collegiate esports have a diversity problem. I am not going to belabor that point. Uh, my co-director Morgan uh, Roman just gave an amazing keynote at the UCI esports conference explaining uh, all about that and uh, actual practical solutions. So I just want to highlight one thing uh, that she talked about uh, during her keynote, which is that there's a real myth uh, that's driving a lot of the problems in uh, collegiate esports, and that's that toxicity is a natural part of competition. So we are going to uh, dispel that myth straight away and, you know, actually talk about the reality, which is that toxicity disproportionately, disproportionately impacts marginalized players. And so I'm imagining that a lot of you, uh, you know, came here today because you know that and you want to make some some actual change. So one of the, the best ways to kind of get started uh, making some of that change is to go back and learn your history. So um, just up on the, the slide up here, I've got a bunch of really excellent books, including two by T.L. Taylor, who's the co-founder of AnyKey, talking about the history of esports uh, and the history of Twitch. And so uh, you can learn more about you know why there's problems by reading a lot of the amazing scholars uh, who have put out uh, work on this. So this is not a, a sort of a, you know educational history lesson today. We're going to have other live streams about that. But uh, for those of you who are curious, I wanted to give you some background reading. Um, what I do want to stress today is that collegiate esports represents a real opportunity for meaningful change. And so uh, I'm really glad to see all of you here because uh, that means that you're ready to make some of that change. So our goal for this stream today is to, to make sure that everybody leaves the training ready to act as allies who are going to ensure that the school gaming groups that they participate in are really meant to welcome everyone. And so we're uh, going to talk about a lot of different uh, practical ways to do that. But before we do, I thought it might be nice to actually introduce myself. I'll create a mirror image of this slide. So for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, I'm Dr. Johanna Brewer. Uh, I am okay with any pronouns, but they, them are probably the most accurate. Um, I am the director of research at AnyKey, uh, but before that, I um, have been uh, sort of making my living as a design activist and a tech startup founder. So I founded a number of non-traditional tech companies, and I have a background in information and computer science. So uh, I've been repping uh, the University of California Irvine's program because I am also a proud anteater, and that's where I have my PhD from. Um, but there's a couple other things that you might not be able to tell just by looking at me. Uh, one of those is that I am native. I kind of mentioned that at the top of this slide. I'm a proud Pequot mixed race kid and I'm streaming to you from my ancestral homeland, so that's pretty fun. I'm also non-binary. Uh, I am non-24, which is a invisible sleeping disorder, and I'm an ethical vegetarian. So you kind of win some of the invisible uh, marginalized trifecta when you're speaking to me. Um, another thing about me that makes me super passionate about this space is that I was a top 10 ranked Worms 2 player when I was in college. And so I care a lot about making sure that esports and gaming are diverse and inclusive for everybody. Um, and also, if you don't know anything about AnyKey and you happen to be here in our channel today, um, you can find out lots more about us by checking out our website. But just to remind you all, uh, our mission at AnyKey is to support diversity, inclusion, and equity in competitive gaming and live streaming. And we do that through research-driven advocacy, education, and outreach, like what we're doing today. And so uh, I want to sort of kick today off with one of the key facts that we like to rep at any key, 
which is that creating an inclusive culture helps competitive teams perform better. And the keynote that Morgan gave, which I keep mentioning, uh, t t takes you through an entire case study of how uh, University of California Irvine's esports team uh, really did perform better by being more inclusive. And so that's just that's just a fact. And we uh, can dig into that more later if we have questions. But what we're here today to do is really level up our skills and, and learn to make positive change in order to to get better, to get more competitive, but also to get more inclusive. So um, before we kind of get into things, I wanted to just sort of poll chat and see, uh, you know, how does everybody else identify? I kind of shared with you uh, my identity, but um, I think uh, our mods are going to drop a link to our poll in chat, but if they don't, I will do it. I'm waiting for my mods. Oh, look at my mods. That's great. So yeah, if you want to check out that poll and people want to start letting us know how they identify. <laughs> yeah. I'll get it up on the screen in a minute. Give everybody a couple seconds to start voting. Here we go. Let's see. So yeah, I mean, as we see, as polls are coming in, we've kind of got a diverse group today. We have women, we have men, we have some other non-binary folks, we have some other queer folks in chat, we have disabled folks, we have people of color, we have white people, and we have mixed race people. So already today, our chat is super diverse, and I am very excited to actually see that happening live, so thank you for all participating in that. And so, uh, yeah, I appreciate you sharing with me your identities because a lot of times, you know, when we're behind a chat and, or even when you see me, you might know, not know how I identify and who I really am. So sometimes it's very welcoming to, to actually, you know, sort of share that with people. So I appreciate you all sharing with that with us. So, you know, we just sort of took a, a, a poll on what our chat is like, but what, what is the reality of gaming like? You know, when we think about the stereotypical gamer, uh, you know, some, sometimes a certain image pops to mind, but if we sort of dig into it, what we, what we really see is that men, women, and people of all genders are playing games at a very similar rate. So 47% of adult men versus 39% of adult women. And when it goes down to teens, it's getting closer as well. 97% of teen boys and 83% of teen girls are playing games. So it's kind of, you know, pretty, pretty bang on even. And then if we look at race, even surprisingly, maybe to the stereotypical image, we see that 44% of black adults and 48% of Hispanic adults are playing video games where only 41% of white adults are. And we see a little bit of an inversion on that on the teen side, and that might have to do with access and exposure, but, you know, and the ability to have that disposable income to afford consoles and PCs and things like that. But what we see is that there is no, you know, one race or, or one gender that dominates gaming. And the same thing is true for LGBTQ and disabled folks. 20% of people who play casual games are disabled. That's on par with the amount of disabled people in the population. More queer folks play games on average than straight and cis folks. And so, you know, when we when we try to say, okay, well, if this many people are are playing games, what is it that we actually want to improve? Why why are we here today? Why are we here to talk about making things better in gaming? Well, the answer is probably not a huge surprise, but it's all about inclusion. And so what we're going to learn today is that even if marginalized folks are represented and they're playing, they might not feel that they're able to meaningfully participate in the community. They might feel isolated, they might feel alone, and they might not feel very welcome. So we're going to learn some practical strategies for changing that. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, well, a lot of people are like, well, does increasing inclusion in my gaming community even matter? Is that important? You know, I, I think you're here because you you believe that, but some people don't know why that matters. And of course, I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, heck yeah, it is a very important thing that you can do. And it's important because games and streams are powerful places where you can connect with other real people and have meaningful interactions like we're doing right now. This is meaningful and this is real. And so if we change the way we do these kinds of things, 
things. We're, we're changing society. And that's because games allow us to experience what it's like to be somebody that we're not. They allow us to connect with friends and make new friends. And they also teach us super valuable skills. They, you know, they help you to become more coordinated, better at problem solving, do teamwork. You can concentrate, you build up your strategies. You can be exposed to new languages, history, culture, all of that comes from gaming. So, you know, when we change what happens in games, we are able to actually change what happens in the world because games are part of the world. So lobbies, chats, arenas, events, those are all real social spaces where when you do things differently, you're having a real impact on society. So that doesn't matter if, you know, you, you feel powerless in other ways. If you change these social spaces, the ones that you're in control of, you're going to change the way the world works. And so in order to really, you know, start making some of that change, it's important that we build up our vocabularies and just come to an understanding around some shared terminology. So one of the things that we hear a lot on the internet is the idea of a marginalized person. And this term gets, you know, very muddied and confusing, but when it comes down to it, all that it means is a marginalized person who's someone is someone who's occupying a, a lower social status in, in, in a larger group. And it means that you're on the margins. Your voice doesn't count as much. And historically, we can see that this has happened through things like not being able to vote, being counted as only three-fifths of a person, things like this, not having representation. So when we think of marginalized people, that includes a lot of folks, and it also sort of depends on the situation. But generally, that means women, that means gender-diverse folks, so non-binary, genderqueer, agender folks, people who are members of the LGBTQ plus community, people of color, people who are disabled, people who are adherents to various religions, folks who are elderly, and in gaming sometimes we might even count that as over 40. And so when we think about who's marginalized, we think about people who are not occupying that center space. And so the, the flip side of that is that there, you know, we can have allies, and allies are people who actively support and stand up for marginalized people. So this is what we're gonna learn to be better at being today. Being someone who actively supports and stands up for marginalized people. Doesn't just mean being like, yeah, I have some friends who are black or I have some friends who are queer. No, it means actually being there for them. So when we think more about some of the other terms that you know get thrown around, diversity is one that you know we need to get some clarity on. So. When we talk about diversity, all that simply means is that there are different types of people represented in the group. So you might have a diverse group because you have folks of color, you have women, you have disabled folks in the group, but your group might not be inclusive unless everyone in that group feels they can meaningfully participate. So it doesn't just mean Diversity means being, you know, in the room and inclusion means having that sort of meaningful seat at the table where you feel like your voice is heard and your participation matters. Similarly, we hear a lot about equality, and that means when we come down to it, ensuring that everyone gets the same thing as everyone else. So in this you know, great example from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we see that that means everyone getting the same size bicycle. But when we talk about equity, what we mean by that is ensuring that everyone gets the thing that's best suited to their needs. So sometimes when folks are focused on equality, they miss the bigger picture of trying to meet everybody's needs and do something that, you know, we would traditionally think of as more fair because it helps people equally in the same way. Similarly, when we think about discrimination, this is something that really only applies to marginalized folks. Discrimination has to do with the fact that marginalized people are being treated inequitably. So they're not getting the thing they need while someone else is. And that can happen from, you know, direct interaction with a person or a bureaucratic system, like maybe not having the ability to choose uh, a gender marker that represents you on your identification, or it can be an algorithm automatically sorting you out and marking you ineligible for participation in something. But discrimination also includes lighter weight stuff, things that we might be more casual about, like just sort of low-key bigoted comments or trash talking someone because of how they look and preventing them from playing because of who they are rather than their level of skill. Harassment is something, on the other hand, that can kind of, you know, really happen to anyone. And that is something when one person subjects another person to unwelcome pressure. Sometimes marginalized folks get 
the, the worst end of this because it's compounded with extra discrimination, but we can all get harassed and it feels bad. And <laughs> harassment includes things like stalking, intimidation, verbally abusing people, threatening people, making sexual advances at them, being offensive or doing disruptive behaviors like spamming or raiding people in a sort of toxic way or sort of hijacking a chat. So harassment takes on lots of forms and being able to identify it is something that we talk a lot about in one of our other trainings. But when we think about how these things sort of build up, when we talk about oppression, what we mean by that is these systemic patterns of discrimination, which are continually disadvantaging, disadvantaging people from marginalized groups. So oppression is not one-off discrimination. It's the fact that it's happening over and over and over and over again to the point where you feel like you can't rise up from your position. And the flip side of oppression is privilege privileges the advantages that are gained by the people who are not oppressed. Because if you are getting, you know, if you're getting hampered, then someone else is going to be able to rise up above that. And so privilege is really what the dominant group gets as a benefit from oppression. You might not even be doing the oppression. It might be bureaucratic or systemic or algorithmic. But if you get benefits, like things handed to you on a plate, that that's the sort of you know advantage of your privilege but the most important thing that uh you know i think we all need to grapple with is intersectionality and that is acknowledging that we each and every one of us are members of multiple social groups that can be subject to overlapping oppression and privilege. So we sort of took a poll on chat and it seems to me that nobody here is oppression free and nobody here is totally privilege free. We all have a little bit of both. And so understanding where those two things come together can start to help make us better allies. Um, so I want to do another quick poll because we just sort of, you know, dove into some vocab. So if uh, our mods could throw another link to this poll in chat, I want to ask you folks all, you know, are any of those terms things that you were surprised about the way that we defined them? Um, are they, you know, are these uh, things that you hadn't heard of before? Or are you feeling pretty comfortable? And if you are having questions, feel free to drop some of those in chat. If any of those terms sounded confusing or if what we just talked about did not seem, uh, you know, uh, all that simple, please, uh, yeah, please let us know. All right, let's see if we can get this little poll going live too. All right. I think we're missing a couple of terms at the bottom here. There was a lot of terms we went through. That's why I wanted to ask. Yeah, that's it's exceeding the boundary of our slide. <laughs> we have we have we have blown out. Yeah. So all right. Yeah. I mean, I I like seeing a lot of people saying, "Oh, okay, I hadn't thought of privilege that way." I think that's that's excellent, and I'm I'm glad that you know that we are sort of opening some minds here because yeah, especially when we think about privilege, a lot of times people think like, "Oh, well, I don't feel privileged. My life is really hard," and a lot of times your life is really hard, but. Sometimes that hardness is built on top of someone's even harder hardness. And so I think that, you know, opening our eyes to what some of these things mean uh, can be really helpful when we, when we try to be better allies. Because sometimes just understanding the terms, the terms that sometimes get weaponized on the internet by, you know, by people uh, sort of spreading misinformation about what this stuff means. This is just about basic fairness and trying to include people in the group. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Ragnar. I mean, yeah, I think that the, you know, intersectionality and really beginning to understand that is something that we all have to sort of do on an ongoing basis. And I include myself in that. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that because allyship is really about a lot of practice. So thank you all for, um, you know, participating in that and giving us a bit of a sense of, you know, what, what you know. And oh, also, yeah, nice to see equity coming up on the list. This is great as well. I just want to shout that out because I think learning more about the difference between equality and equity can be really important because sometimes we rush to want everyone to have the same thing. And that sometimes doesn't undo, you know, years of oppression or just starting points for everybody. So sometimes actually, you know, that kind of fairness and trying to institute that can be a fine line to walk. So 
as we've, you know, taken this first step towards building our vocabularies, trying to learn more about how do we talk about, you know, being better allies, doing better at diversity and inclusion, um, we, we need to sort of, you know, kick it up a, a notch. And that's what we're really here for today, which is to level up our allyship skills. So now that we're sort of understanding what does it mean to be an ally? What does it mean to support people, you know, who have gone through discrimination, who have gone through harassment? Um, I want to just, before we even jump into uh, learning about the allyship skills, I want to throw them up on the screen here and see, um, you know, what of these skills do you folks feel comfortable with? So it's, it's time for another poll. I'm sure the mods are completely, uh, you know, enjoying my total lack of dedication to copy pasta. Um, but, you know, when we think about allyship skills and the skills we're going to be covering today, it includes listening to marginalized folks, giving credit where credit is due, um, focusing on using inclusionary language and dropping out our usage of in, uh, exclusionary terms. We're also going to learn about how we can pass the privilege that we have and share some of our knowledge with other people. And we're going to learn more about how we support marginalized folks, how we make meaningful welcoming gestures, and how do we widen our circles. So uh, I don't know, what do you folks think? Are these things that you're already feeling comfortable with? Do you, <laughs> do you know, uh, you know, do you have skills? Do you feel like these are things you're gonna be, this is all gonna be boring for you and you're gonna already be flexing all your knowledge in chat about how you do this stuff or what? So let's see how it's going. All right, so we've got folks um, saying, all right, they're good at listening, they're good at giving credit, they're good at using inclusionary language, supporting marginalized folks. All right, interesting that we've got a lack of uh, folks uh, knowing about meaningful welcoming gestures. I'm going to be excited to talk uh, more about that today because I think that, you know, building up each of these skills and figuring out what we do know and what we don't know is, uh, is good. Oh, I've seen, we had someone creep in and say, all right, I know how to be welcoming. I know how to be welcoming. All right, I like that. I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, it seems like, you know, we've got some knowledge in chat already, but let's see if we can, you know, blow, uh, blow some of your minds or just reinforce some of those skills as, as we move along. So thank you all for participating in that. I appreciate that. So, so let's talk about listening to marginalized folks. Well, first of all, uh, you're here and you're listening to me and I'm marginalized. So thank you. You, you you've kicked it off right. Um, but what, what does that mean? So when I talk about listening to marginalized folks, that means seeking out their stories and learning their perspectives. So you got to be active about this stuff. You got to go out and, and make an effort. You know, you, you don't know this stuff. If, if you didn't grow up in, in a, uh, you know, a mixed race household or you didn't grow up knowing anyone who was queer or, or maybe you did, but you just don't know your history. Get out there and, and learn about this stuff and actually take the time to educate yourself and try to see the world from their point of view view. So especially for folks in collegiate esports, I think one of the best ways to do that is like watch and read interviews from marginalized players. Like who do you idolize? You know, like who, who's marginalized and like, go and learn their story. Like it's not, you know, that that's not creepy. That's not weird. That's being a fan. And that's understanding where someone's coming from. So, you know, there's plenty of content out there. Just get on YouTube, get on Twitch, uh, go on Twitter and, and see, you know, like follow people on Instagram, listen to their stories and, and see what their lives are like and just kind of immerse yourself in that. And what's really important here is like spend time doing that and and just absorb their perspective without commenting. It's not your job to talk about this right now. It's your job to listen right now. And so just like go out there and, and hear those perspectives because you might not have realized how much you have missed. You know, dedicate yourself. Do it for 10 days. Do it for 30 days. Something like that. Just, just listen for a while and, and see what you might not have been hearing so far. And then, you know, another really important part of listening to marginalized folks is to trust in firsthand accounts when somebody shares them with you. You know, a lot of times you didn't experience something. And so you, you might knee jerk react, well, that couldn't have happened. That doesn't sound real. And that's something that a lot of marginalized people face you know stuff happens to us that hasn't happened to other folks and so people just don't want to believe that it's real and being told that something that happened to you isn't real is is really painful and so one of the best things you can do is show your support by saying i believe you just literally tell people yeah i believe you you know because because you might not have ever this might not have ever happened to you but you know maybe you're used to people believing you when you tell them something wrong happened but some people have never had that experience and so just letting them know that you believe them is big and and that 
you know, that speaks to the fact that, you know, it takes real courage to report upsetting behavior that you were witness to or that happened to you. And that can be even more so if you're marginalized, because a lot of times when you do, you are accused of creating drama for attention. And that kind of discrediting stories is an oppressive tactic that pushes those stories down so other people's hard stories get more lifted up, right? And so, you know, if your reaction is like, no, 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 there's no way, you're just creating drama, check yourself for a second. Just be like, okay, uh, maybe I got to hold back for a second. Maybe there's a lot that's in me that I've been you know, absorbing that I don't, I don't want to jump that gun and immediately disbelieve someone. Let, let me just listen. Again, this is step one is, is all about listening. And so another important facet of that is to focus on what the person is saying rather than their tone. So this idea of tone policing, trying to jump in and focus on, you know, correcting somebody's emotions by saying, hey, you're getting too upset. That, that's not helpful. <laughs> Sometimes people are, are justifiably upset or angry and they might be having a tough time in, in keeping that anger in check because they are really hurt. So just because someone is coming at you with a lot of emotions, don't immediately dismiss them just because of that because something really bad might have happened. And so focus on the content of the person's words rather than their tone. And if you find yourself wanting to correct their tone, again, stop, take a breath and focus and listen and don't offer that information. Listening is really hard. <laughs> um, so again, uh, same thing about getting criticized. So if you get criticized, don't get defensive. Uh, one of the hardest things to do is just practice taking that breath and acknowledging. Don't rush to explain yourself. Don't say, oh, I'm sorry if you misgender someone and immediately start saying, oh, well, it was because I forgot that, you know, you had, no, 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 just calm down and take a breath and just apologize. And, you know, sometimes you might feel a little bit in doubt. You're not even fully ready to apologize or acknowledge what happened because, you know, you feel caught in the moment. But you can practice saying things like, I hear you. I'll think about that. You know, just let people know that their words were received. And maybe right in that moment, don't jump to get defensive, to disagree, you know, whatever, to interact. Just, just be there and hear someone. And sometimes, if, even if you do disagree, you can just hold that for yourself and you can just tell the person that you heard them. And that's, you know, that's an important step towards being a real ally. So besides listening to, to marginalized folks, it's really important to give credit where it's due. And uh, a bunch of you said like, all right, you know, I'm pretty familiar with that too. I'm good at listening to marginalized folks. And I think I can, you know, I can give, I can give good credit where it's due. So let's step through that a bit though. So one of the important things uh, about giving credit is celebrating everybody who's been involved in the win. You know, sometimes it's really fun to shout out our MVPs and like the people who are the leaders and the ones who are getting all of the glory and it's easy to get behind them and cheer on the stars. But it's important to take that time to shout out all the supporting members of your team. So whether they're, you know, a starting member, if they're someone who's really, you know, sort of just getting their footing in the club, or if they're someone who is, you know, a lot more experienced, everybody who was involved in that win should get a shout out. And just, you know, make, make sure you do that and welcome everybody and don't just focus on your stars. And that's even more true or sort of... Uh, more challenging to remember to shine a light on the people who are behind the scenes. A lot of times there's a tremendous amount of hidden work that goes into uh, making a, a great college team or college club. You know, so team managers, coaches, club officers, there's a lot of folks who are not even, you know, uh, in the arena playing the game and they're making this happen and they're making their club great. So it's really important to remember to shout those folks out as well and to acknowledge them because without that work, you know, the team wouldn't be what it is. And I also just want to point out, you know, make sure that everybody remembers that it. It's, you know, unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, it is the case that women take on a lot more of the work around organizing events and practices and scrimmages and stuff like that. And so, you know, it's great to have that kind of control, but sometimes that, that work of creating a space where everybody feels welcome and happy and can participate, it's, it's a lot of effort that sometimes goes unrecognized. It's 
part of that behind the scenes effort that gets overlooked. And so really making an effort to shine that extra light on those folks is going to go a long way to making people feel welcome in your group. Another thing that you can focus on doing within your clubs and your teams is to use inclusionary language and to drop inclusionary terms, uh, exclusionary terms. And so uh, when we think about what that kind of means, uh, the, the first and the most important one, and like I rep a lot because I mentioned I'm non-binary, but address groups without assuming their gender. I mean, you don't know the gender of the folks you're talking to unless you ask or if you poll them like we poll chat. So, you know, that means trying to weed out gendered words if, you know, it we're talking about English here, but in any language that you speak, and stop using those kinds of terms. So that means no more ladies and gents, boys and girls, guys and gals, dudes and chicks, bros. Uh, you know, we can start introducing terms like folks, friends, peeps, pals, fam, all y'all, all that kind of stuff. When we stop, uh, you know, focusing on always gendering the group of people that we're talking to that imagine, you know, we might not even know it makes more space for other people. And I think especially in esports, one of the things that I would love to see people stop saying is let's go boys. <laughs> I hear let's go boys so much on Twitch and I'm always like, Oh, well, kind of, but <laughs> you know, I think that we can change that. And you know, if you, if you just, rep let's go fam or let's go peeps or whatever it's just a small change but it really makes a difference to people who don't feel like they're a boy um and that's the same thing also with how you joke around a lot of times on the internet we use a lot of casual bigotry even if we're not being hateful there are you know a lot of times we hear people say things like that's so gay you play like a girl don't be retarded and those things are not nice things to say because what you're doing is you're using somebody's identity as an insult to a person who doesn't hold that identity, which if you are gay or a girl or disabled, then you will feel like, wait, why is it insulting to be that kind of thing? And so using identity-based insults is really just, you know, I don't know, it's just very non-comfy and people don't feel welcome in spaces where they hear those kinds of jokes being made. And so it's the same thing about trash talk. If you're gonna trash talk people, be creative about it and don't bring up personal traits. You don't need to make fun of people's gender, their sexual orientation, their race, their ethnicity, their disability, the way they look, the size of their body, their age, their religion. None of those things are fair game for insulting people when you are playing, but you can trash their skills. You can diss their content, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. You know, I mean, I think a lot of gaming is really about getting in people's face, popping off. Some of that can be really fun, but don't go and attack people for stuff that they can't change. You know, it's not, it doesn't feel welcoming. It just feels low. And so I think that eliminating a lot of these exclusionary terms from your vocabulary and also shutting that down when you see other people doing it is going to go a long way to creating a more welcoming environment. doesn't mean you shouldn't trash talk people. It just means you shouldn't do it using identity-based insults. And so beyond just being more inclusionary with our language, we can also actively pass some of our privilege and some of our knowledge to other people. We can, we can give more than just, you know, creating that space. We can kind of give back. So some of the important things that, you know, I want to encourage everybody who's been hanging out here today to go into your spaces and focus on teaching other people how to be allies. Whatever you learn today, share that, you know, lead by example, spread some of those skills, you know, and, and show and show what it means to be an ally by acting like one in your spaces. So that means, you know, speaking up when people are doing exclusionary things. If you see these kinds of behavior, if you, you know, if you hear people going, let's go boys, say something else and encourage your friends to say something else and explain why, you know, it's like, well, you know, I, I came to this NEQ live stream and they were saying that makes people feel pretty left out when we keep saying, let's go boys. So let's start saying, let's go fam, you know? And I think, just that simple act of saying something, of, of passing your privilege by using some of that you know, knowledge you have and teaching other people about what to do is really, really powerful. And that's the kind of thing that you can do to make actual change in your space. It seems small, but it's actually really big. And so one of the other things that you can do really depends on what your role is in your space. So a lot of people um, in chat probably get opportunities. You know, they might be, you know, getting, um, 
uh, requests for interviews. Uh, they might be getting a lot of attention on social media. They might be getting, you know, called to do uh, interesting exhibition stuff, things like that. If you're always getting those kind of opportunities, you know, you're building your career too, and that's important, but try to think about handing some of those off to somebody else. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it's not even about, oh, I don't have time and I want to pass it off. It's about actually saying, hey, wait a second, I have been called and asked to do this, but I think somebody else in my squad would be, would really benefit from that opportunity. So I want to hand that over and doing that and shining a light, you know, on people, especially behind the scenes by passing those opportunities off is going to be a big deal and so you know really trying to with what you have spread that around and I, I feel like you know that's something that a lot of people who hang out on twitch they know about that they know about what it's like to you know raid somebody else's channel pass along your viewers that kind of thing and so i think that you know this this passing the privilege we can do that in all kinds of ways in our spaces when we have opportunities for exposure we can think about how we might share those with the rest of our squad those who don't get that opportunity as much and also, if you have skills, whatever kind of skills you have, you know, maybe you're, you're, maybe you are really good at the game that you're playing, but maybe you're a great caster, or you're a good organizer, or you know how to stream, or you know how to mod, any of these kinds of things, you know, or, or even if you know how to set up some of the stuff for, you know, your team's website. Just consider mentoring somebody else who needs help to grow. And especially that's true for the juniors and the seniors who are, you know, in chat here. You know, think about how you might find a freshman, a sophomore and say like, okay, I'm going to pass some of my knowledge and my skills down to you because I want to help you grow. And I know that, you know, college goes by quick and I want to be able to pass some of that on and, and, you know, spot some of the folks who are marginalized and give them a hand. That is not wrong. You know, it is not wrong to intentionally help someone who probably has not gotten that help that you might've gotten that got you to the place where you're at. So if you have those skills, don't be shy about offering them. I mean, the worst thing that happens is I'm going to say, no, thanks. I don't want your help. But if you offer that help, if you, if you, actually give someone an opportunity to say, yeah, I actually would appreciate that. That's going to open a lot of doors for people and it's going to strengthen your community. Another thing that you can focus on doing, very basic, <laughs> uh, a bunch of you said that, okay, you know, you, you feel like you know how to handle this, but it's supporting marginalized folks. But what, what does supporting marginalized folks mean? All right. Well, so one of the most basic things you can do is engage with their content. So that's watching their stream, following their socials, attending their events, and generally enjoying the stuff that they create. You know, if you are spending time, think about who you're, who you're viewing, who you're spending your hours on, your minutes on, your bits on, whatever. You know, who are you paying attention to? You know, your attention, your time, it's worth something. So whose content are you engaging with? If you went out and you sought out some of those stories from marginalized folks, Continue engaging with that content, you know, after you've spent your time listening, become part of that and sort of, I don't know, I can't stress this enough. Do this for your friends, for your teammates, for your club mates, for the people in your social circle. It is so important to have, you know, to give people a boost, right? If you are there, if you're in the audience, if you are in the chat, you know, if you're there with them during their events, during their competitions, being a vocally supportive ally and cheering them on is huge. It's huge for, you know, their own internal uh, compass and their own support and their own energy, but it's also a really big way to keep the trolls at bay because if, you know, they roll in with a squad of people who support them, they're less likely to be seen as vulnerable and get harassed or discriminated against because they have, you know, they have their their protective squad around them. So engaging with people's content and engaging with the content of your own teammates is super, super important. Show up for each other, be there for each other. And go out of your way to highlight marginalized folks. Again, I keep saying this, it's not wrong to go out of your way to shine more of a light on folks who have historically been overlooked and are overlooked in people's, you know, kind of mind's eye, right? People don't think, oh, this is the kind of person who does that. I didn't think they were a gamer. So go out of your way to highlight folks in in your circle that that are marginalized if you share their work and you rep you know you rep it with your friends that's going to go a long way you know to to changing to changing what feels like the norm in your community you can also sort of 
be be a friend and and send marginalized folks positivity. I want to be clear, like that doesn't mean just like flood people with messages that you don't know. But you know, when you are in somebody's chat, you can say nice things to them if there are trolls. When you are in an arena, you can you know be positive to someone after a game who maybe didn't feel, I don't know, they were looking a little bit down. Any kind of positive support can be a huge boost. And sometimes it feels awkward to, you know, go up to someone and say something nice. You can feel like, oh, I don't know, I feel weird about giving this compliment. Or, I don't know, that, that seems awkward or cringy for me to go up and say that to someone I don't know super well yet. Well, it can be a great way to get to know somebody, but it's also okay, you know? Like, so, sometimes we have to push past some of our, you know, discomfort and our patterns to create new ones. And so actually making a little bit of effort to be 10% more positive towards the marginalized folks in your community is something that is, is going to build a lasting effect. And simply, if you can buy people stuff, uh, that helps. And I know, you know, whatever, when we're, you know, we don't have a lot of money to spare in college, it is not an easy uh, thing to ask of people to, you know, uh, shell out money. But I think that if you do have any bits of disposable income, trying to direct that towards gamers and streamers who are, you know, at, at a at a disadvantage can can really help. And so, you know, like if that's just subbing to a stream that's donating some bits, if it's donating a dollar, I think that kind of support it really means a big deal, you know? So uh, that's not a must, but it's definitely on the list of a great way to help support marginalized folks. Um, but as we sort of kicked off this stream, we talked a lot about making meaningful welcoming gestures. And I started with a land acknowledgement. And there's a lot of other meaningful welcoming gestures that we can make, including sharing your pronouns when introducing yourself, which I did. But I think that, you know, we've noticed that a lot of people who are trans or non-binary tend to be uh, the, per the folks who have, I don't know, traditionally have been trying to push the idea of sharing pronouns. And sometimes it's really not sometimes all the time it's really great when you hear allies doing that because it means like okay no matter what my pronouns are or no matter how i identify i know it's important to share that with people and again it can sometimes be a weird habit to build up but doing that both in person when you meet people who uh, you haven't met before and doing that in online situations so putting those in your socials or sharing them you know in discord through you know various role assignments things like that uh, making sure sure you have those, uh, make, making sure that pronoun sharing is a normal part of any kind of community uh, meetings that you have, uh, you know, like whether you're doing stuff on Zoom right now and you're meeting up or later on if you're meeting up in person when that ever can happen again. <laughs> um, making sure that, you know, as, as a leader in your community, you try to just make that be normal. And at first, the first few times you might stumble over it, but actually making that be part of your regular practice is important. Another thing that you can do to feel welcoming is to caption your videos and your images. So that includes live streams. And I want to be honest that uh, <laughs> we messed up and our live stream is not closed captioned today because we had some technical problems. But this is something that is important to do if you possibly can. Uh, we will probably be talking more about technical tools about things like this at a certain point for different platforms. But just knowing that there are many technical solutions to uh, captioning your images and captioning, uh, creating alt text for your images and captioning uh, video is a great way to make your content more accessible to uh, all kinds of folks with different disabilities on the internet. Uh, another thing that you can do is to practice aspirational marketing. And what I mean by that is, even if your club or your team isn't very diverse right now, and you can create uh, in your social media, on your website, pictures and representation that shows the kind of group you would like to have. And I don't mean creating fake images of your team, but alongside images of you and your team showing pictures of people doing the kinds of things that you do, but who don't necessarily look like you, who look like the kind of folks that you want to attract. So when you're creating any kind of social media for your team, think about that. Think about who you are representing in the pictures that you're putting out onto the internet and think about, you know, does that look like a diverse group? Do people who are not look, do not look like us feel like they would be welcome here? And what could we do to change that? So it's not about being disingenuous. It's about trying to create the picture in the world that you want to attract because that shows to people that you, uh, that you are welcoming and you would be happy to have them as part of your group.
And so the last thing you can really do as an ally is to focus on widening your circle. And this is, you know, the sort of what what the aspirational marketing is geared towards. It's showing people that we're going to make, you know, we're going to make this group more diverse, encompass more people. And we can do that by in a variety of very practical ways. So we can seek out like-minded groups and avoid ones that aren't inclusive. And that's really uh, an important thing to stress that, you know, when we think about who we're going to collaborate with, like I said, we only have limited amounts of time uh, to spend, limited amounts of attention, limited amounts of our focus. And so if we, if we as a club or as a team are partnering, scrimmaging, doing stuff together with other teams who do not welcome other people, then the likelihood that our team is going to attract a div more diverse group of people is, is low. Because it seems clear that our priorities are not necessarily to... to collaborate or to hang out with people who are welcoming. And so, you know, kind of picking your friends wisely, thinking about who you align yourself with is really important and taking stock of that, you know, and as we said earlier, pushing your friends and other people in your circle to be more inclusive is the first step, right? You know, like, of course, it's not like, oh, we just want to cancel people. But thinking about, all right, if I've really tried to get, you know, this other group to be more welcoming and they just don't want to be, then maybe it's not time for you to keep collaborating with them because you're not going to be able to uh, attract new folks if you're sort of stuck in old toxic patterns. And uh, in order to kind of attract new people, the important thing you have to do is look outside your bubble. And I think that's something that, you know, especially now, especially we're all kind of bubbled up, uh, it can be hard to do. But I think that pushing ourselves to look outside of the social circles that we feel comfortable in, uh, we can do that in a lot of different ways. And I think, you know, uh, in on a, on a college campus, one of the best ways to do that is to think about reaching out to other clubs on campus that represent marginalized folks. So that might mean the Black Student Union, the Muslim Student Union, uh, women in STEM groups, uh, LGBTQ plus groups, things like that. Other campus clubs that are explicitly about, uh, you know, different forms of uh, different marginalized folks and, and lifting them up, think about partnering with them and organizing events. You know, even now, even while we are all bubbled up, think about trying to reach out to some of those groups and organize an online tournament or just like uh, an online play day where you all hang out and you know, sit on Discord and you go through a bunch of scrimmages together, whatever. You know, think about how might you open your your space, even in, you know, in this virtual moment to folks in other groups and how might you widen that circle by actually actively reaching out and saying like, hey, let's work on something together. Let's partner on something and be, you know, being honest about why you want to do that. Like, we want more, we want more queer people to come to our club. And so we think it would be awesome if the Gay Student Union uh, collaborated with us on on an event and go from there you know you're going to find your allies by reaching out and and offering that 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 hand um and then i think as i've been stressing you know over and over again today it's important that you encourage your friends to, to participate in this stuff too as an ally it's not just about doing it yourself it's about having is about widening your circle by also sort of dragging your friends into this make it a quest for everybody to sort of expand your party together this isn't the kind of thing you can do alone you can't make your group more welcoming all by yourself you need to do that as a team so you know not being shy about actually bringing <laughs> bringing your friends into this uh in, into this scheme is going to be an important part of it and again that's the kind of thing that you know takes takes time it takes courage to start building up those, you know, hey, how about we do this? If you're the first person saying that in the group, you know, it might not work the first time, but keep pushing for it and, and keep encouraging, you know, more people to, to join in. So we've, you know, we've gone through a lot of very practical allyship skills today, and we kind of went into a lot more of the details about what these things entail. Because I think, you know, when we started uh, the, uh, started earlier today with a poll saying, okay, you know, are we comfortable with this stuff? Um, a lot of you were saying, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know these things, but let's, uh, let's kind of, you know, hit that back again and, and take another poll. So this will, uh, let's see if the mods are still awake here. See if everybody's still awake here. 
Um, and think about, you know, all right, now that we've actually gone into some of these skills and talked about, <laughs> nice job mods, thank you, uh, and talked about what, what these things entail, you know, how do you feel now? And what do you think you could work on? What do you think, you know, after, after the stream, after hearing about different ways of being an ally, what do you think you could do better? And what might you want to commit to when you walk away from here today to actually trying to do something a little bit, you know, putting a little more effort into this? All right, let's see how it's going. So, all right, here we can get this back in here. All right. Yeah. All right. I like seeing, I like seeing a lot of folks are thinking about passing their privilege and widening their settlers. That's great. I mean, yeah, some of, you know, passing the privilege, that can be something that we often forget to do. You know, we're all out there hustling, right? Like we're all, you know, we're, no one's having an easy time. I mean, the 0.1% of people are having an easy time, but for the most part, we're, we're all struggling. But the reality is, as we talked about in the beginning, you know, we have, there's, there's there's intersectionality at play and we do have some privilege and we do I do know that there are certain ways even though I'm a marginalized person like here I am I have a PhD I'm live streaming I have some serious privilege right now so I gotta pass that on to people and I gotta think about that and I gotta I gotta I gotta remember that because it's not all just about me it's about lifting us up together and I think that's the same thing widening the circle you know we can often feel very hesitant about getting outside our bubble because it's unknown and it's it's scary and we don't necessarily feel like we're going to be accepted when we try to do that we might feel like well maybe people don't want to be friends with me yeah they might not and that's okay um and you can try again but trying to intentionally widen your circle and trying to like i said bring your friends into that is a big deal and then yeah also meaningful welcoming gestures i think that you know, and we called our own selves out for it. We have to do better. That's something that I constantly strive to do better at. And I feel like there's nothing wrong with putting intentionality, even if you are the person who's explaining to other people on the internet how to be more inclusive. I need to remember myself, you know, okay, I got to focus on my welcoming gestures and I have to, you know, think about how do I actually set a space where people are going to feel like they want to talk to me and there's new ways to do that all the time and trying to actually open your mind to that and keep striving is very important so yeah i appreciate you folks all actually taking some time to be honest with yourselves about what you could be better at because i know a lot of you said that oh, i feel pretty comfortable with a lot of these skills but it turns out that there are things that we can all improve with so you know that's that's really the message of today's training. And I'm saying that, you know, as an individual too, that we constantly need to practice and I screw up all the time. And like I said, don't, I don't get defensive when I make a mistake. I don't rush to explain myself. I just say, sorry. And I try to do better through my actions and just keep practicing because like with everything else, just like with competitive games, you can't be good at it the first time you try to do it. You know, if some of the things we talked about today, they might be the first time you thought about doing that. And so the first time you try to do a welcoming gesture, do a land acknowledgement and say, okay, I've spent the time to understand what indigenous lands I'm actually on. And I'm going to say, thank you for that. That might feel weird and awkward, especially if you're not a native American, <laughs> but it's okay. You can try and people will think you're really cool for trying. <laughs> and that's what allyship is about. It's about getting outside your comfort zone and practicing something you don't necessarily know how to do. And like I said, everybody is making those mistakes. I make those mistakes. My co-director makes those mistakes. We all make those mistakes, but that's how we get better. Because if we aren't prepared to make errors, we're not going to be trying and we're not going to be improving. And so I very much want to remind of all of you just not to rage quit if you mess up, you know, if you leave here today saying, I want to be a better ally and I'm going to do this. And then you encounter something that doesn't go well. Don't, you know, don't flip out. Just, you know, keep it comfy and you're going to be able to do this. Just keep trying. Come back to more of our live streams. Hang out with us um, <laughs> and check out some of our materials and we can we can help you do this. So before we all uh, uh, head off today, I just want to take one last poll in chat and see. All right. 
Do you feel like you're actually ready to take action as an ally after today? Do you feel like you've learned some stuff that you can actually be practical about and get in there and intervene? Um, or did this still feel pretty opaque and do you think you're going to need to come back? And or do we need to improve the way that we explain this stuff? Um, let's see. All right. Okay. We're getting some strong yeses. I appreciate those yeses. I like to see that. I like to see that. I'll take a no as well. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's great to see that we're, we feel like we can actually, <laughs> we can actually uh, be allies. So, all right. Well, I appreciate uh, everybody who's been hanging out with us. Um, I want to, uh, we're going to have some more time afterwards uh, for some questions. Um, but before we roll into questions, I do just want to uh, once again uh, thank our sponsors. So I want to say thanks to the Air Force for supporting uh, this stream. And also thanks to Intel for supporting all the research that went into the Inclusion 101 uh, streams that are going to be uh, continuing to roll out. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we've got some time for questions. Like, we said an hour, but we figured, all right, we started a couple minutes late, and we have some time for questions, so we can we can kick that over uh, and see if anybody in chat has anything going on. I will like hide hide the slides and see what's up and talk to talk to all y'all now that I've been sort of talking to this this camera and trying to simultaneously read chat, but you know it's a little bit a little bit hard to do all of that. <laughs> the Q and A cam, yes, the Q and A cam is now active. I will, I will actively explain things. All right, so there was a question earlier. I am eagerly anticipating this question. Oh man, this is like so much anticipation. All right, I have a question. How do you approach a situation like that when a female player refers to the team as the boys and it upsets the other team? That's interesting. So you're talking about like, okay, if there's a female player on the opposing team and, and she keeps calling the other team the boys, I think that's something where it goes both ways, right? We want to think about, of course, you know, of course, because we're talking about, you know, speaking to another female player, you know, we have to recognize that she's coming from, you know, a, a marginalized place, right? So we don't need to be tone policing her. We don't need to be all up in her face about correcting her. But if you sincerely want to do that and you sincerely feel like actually that is not very comfy, I do not like how you're doing that, and I think it would make this space better if you didn't, think about the way in which you would do that. Maybe do that in a kind of offline moment, you know, a DM, say something, you know, sincere, right? And think, think about the person's perspective, right? She probably doesn't want to be mansplained to. <laughs> she probably gets harassed a lot, right? And so, you know, think about what that adjustment is trying to do. Are you sincerely trying to make this place feel more welcoming? Or are you just trying to tell a person who deals with a lot of stuff how to be better, right? Like where, where is that coming from? And I think that there, so there's no right answer, right? There's no, uh, one, you know, correct way to do that. But you know, if, and especially if it's a member of your own team, you know what I mean? That's a different story, right? Like if this person is a stranger to you, just telling them, Hey, you know, like, you need to not say that it's like, okay, well, that's the first time I ever met you. So I'm not hundred percent sure if, you know, like I need to take your advice, but if it's, you know, if you're talking about, Oh, there's a, a female member of our team and you know, she's often doing that. Yeah. You know, like take your friend aside and, and explain that, you know what I mean? And so I think that again, like I said, when we think about the intersectionality of the situation think about like where are we where's our role what are we trying to do are we being an ally like if we're trying to be an active ally does that mean you know modifying the behavior of a person who is already marginalized or not you know so like i said there's no uh there's no correct answer but it's really about that uh situational um you know kind of aspect so all right i see a question from ragnar in chat it says i know there is no magic answer to this but how do you see college campuses balancing a general free-for-all we're having a game night come play versus partnering specifically with a marginalized demographic to say game night with these awesome peeps you know yeah right when there isn't a pandemic um all right yeah um so even even during the pandemic if we're having a free for all game night versus a game night that targets specific uh you know groups of marginalized folks i think the the thing to remember is that one single event or moment in time is neither for you know it's never going to be for everyone there's no 
single action you can do that is maximally inclusive. It's really thinking about the patterns you build up over time. And so it's going to depend on where your group is currently at. So one of the things that we do at any key and that we promote is doing a diversity audit of your group, you know, just like taking stock. We have tools for that. That's a service we offer, et cetera, et cetera. But what's important is like getting a sense of where you are at and and setting actual goals about how you might want to expand your diversity. And so I think that there are definite good reasons for focused nights that welcome certain groups of people because in those moments we see that players from different marginalized groups who would have never felt comfortable before feel for the first time welcome to do something because it is explicitly for them and when you build up a pattern of doing certain events like that and then you fold that in with your other events that are generally all inclusive you know what I mean that are more like everybody is welcome everybody is welcome seems true if you have made each individual you know like pocket of humanity feel welcome right it's like the specificity and the multiplicity it's like you want to actually you know target many 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 different groups of people in order to create that everyone right it's like i don't know the stone soup metaphor it's like you got to put all of the things in the pot to really have that melting pot of all togetherness so it's okay to go out and like you know pick those sort of specific things and then balance that with general inclusiveness um Let's see. All right. Oh, well, thank you very much. We're, we're having uh, one of our uh, one of our illustrious members of our uh, advisory committee uh, shouting us out. Thank you very much, Lafista. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Let's see. So we have another question in chat. Have you had trouble with how you are perceived when you push for allyship? As in, what is the balance between being an active ally and being seen as a social justice warrior? Right, right, right. So everybody, not everybody, maybe everybody in chat has heard social justice warrior used kind of as a slur, as a derogatory thing, as a way of silencing people who are trying to stand up. And like I said, this goes along with a lot of the sort of tone policing or discrediting stuff or you're just being a social justice warrior. Okay. Um, no, you know, that, that, that is, that is emphatically not a label that I put on myself and what, you know, most folks who are active allies want to do is make the world feel more welcoming. And so there are plenty of times when you, when you are trying to be more welcoming, you will be perceived as, you know, I don't know, having some other mislabeled agenda. And that's just a, like I said before, that's one of those sort of toxic, oppressive techniques that tries to silence a perspective. But it's really just sort of about, I mean, very simply, just like standing in the truth and reality. Like, and I can often be, uh, you know, Oh, oh, I mean, very, very simple in, in the ways in which I react, which is just like, yeah, no, I'm just trying to be welcoming. And so I get that that's, you know, not what you are pushing for, but that's what I'm trying to do. And anything that you, you know, accuse me of, it, it, you got to sort of let it roll off you. And I think that that's what, you know, you'll hear from a lot of folks who, uh, who are marginalized. Um, and we, uh, in some of our other trainings, we, we delve into some of the stories of marginalized folks and what they've experienced. And, you know, a lot of what you end up doing is building up that thick skin and saying like, Hey, stop, like, stop criticizing me. I don't even care. Like, you don't want me to do this. You don't want me to make the world more welcoming. I'm not even going to listen to you. That's really like a feed the trolls sort of situation. So I, I, whenever I hear people like, you know, social justice warrior, it's kind of immediately, that's probably not a path I want to open up. And you want to think about where are you spending your time and attention and what are you trying to do? Maybe that person is not the first person's mind that you you need to change. So also see in chat, we have another question. How do you balance free speech and unwanted negative language? Someone may say something terrible, but due to free speech, they are protected. Yeah, this is another one of those things. Free speech is another one of those um, kind of oppressive buzzword things, which is like, yeah, yeah, but free speech. And I want to, I, I get to say whatever I want. It's like, yeah, I mean, by law, currently in the, you know, the United States, you can say all manner of horrible things. But the reality is that that's not actually very nice. And so it's not necessarily about about the actual 
uh, you know, laws about what kind of things we can say to one another. It's about what kind of people do we want to be and what kind of society and world do we want to create. Obviously, right now, you know, there's there there is and has always been hotly debated uh, discussions about what should be laws, right? So what is actually a law in any given country is, you know, a useful and important thing to know, but it is also not how you have to behave in your house or in your stream or in your school. Uh, you can be better than what the law requires, and that's okay. And so a lot of times when we talk about, uh, you know, the spaces that we are in control of and the standards that our group set, we can say like, yeah, no, that's true that, you know, by law that, that you know, this that would be allowed. But in this group and the way that we function, and what we want to do is different than that. And so it's not about arguing uh, some other rule set. It's about arguing what the rules are in the place that you're in right now and the, try to, the space you're trying to create. And so we can create new and different rules in those spaces in order to kind of change maybe some of the rules in, in other places. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, uh, I'm seeing some like great... Uh, uh, um, advice about, you know, the different kind of things that, you know, we can do to partner. And I, I think that's important. Uh, UCI uh, has been doing some really great stuff and, you know, partnering with their LGBTQ resource center to host a trans game day, I think was a really uh, cool, uh, you know, moment they had. And like Lonnie's saying in chat that, you know, otherwise a lot of the attendees there had said like, yeah, I wouldn't have come if it had just been free for all. So knowing that specifically I was invited, right, rather than anyone can attend, but like people like you should attend is a very different kind of invitation. And I think that can be something that is a, a huge welcoming gesture. And, you know, as we said earlier, there, there are going to be some people who might say things like, wait a second, that's not welcoming to me then. And it's like, in that specific moment, you are not the most welcome. But that doesn't mean you won't be welcome later, and that's okay, we take turns, right? And this is something that, you know, a lot of us as kids understood. We could take turns, and 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 that can, you know, lead to a broader form of inclusion. Yeah, so I think we're, you know, there's... <laughs> Exactly, as Roulette is saying, um, there's, you know, lots of rules for spaces, like no shirt, no shoes, no service, no mask, no service, um, that, you know, you can apply to your spaces that are public, you know, but they they go a level above, right? And so that's really okay. When, when we want to create a, a comfy space, sometimes we have to create extra rules that go above and beyond what the standards uh, might be in that space. Um, all right. Well, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're past our, we're past our hour, but, uh, we've had some really great questions in chat. I don't know if there's anything else. We'll probably wrap up in a couple of minutes. Um, but I also just want to, uh, generally shout out a, a couple of different things. <laughs> um, uh -oh, one more, wait, there is one more. Um, is this, is this one more question from, let's see from my co-director or is this just one more existential question but um while we're maybe waiting for one more question yeah i did want to just uh shout out a couple of things that have been uh rotating in chat but like i said um we have lots of resources on on anykey.org slash inclusion dash 101 that you can check out um to learn more about how to make your gaming club more inclusive we're going to be running another stream, same time, uh, uh, 12 p.m. PET, 3 p.m. ET, and 8 p.m. Uh, European time um, on Thursday, uh, specifically for streamers who are interested in learning about being uh, more inclusive. And uh, also definitely want to uh, encourage everybody to take the GLHF pledge if you haven't yet. Um, we are on closing in on our 1 million signature mark. We're over 800,000 now. So we're looking for, you know, more people to come and join and keep it comfy uh, on Twitch chats. And uh, yeah, um, we will be uh, back again on Thursday. And thanks everyone 
so much for hanging out and uh, all the great questions. And, uh, you know, we really, uh, we really appreciate people who want to take that next step and learn to be allies. It means a lot to me and also to my co-director because, uh, you know, we, we want to keep the, the internet a little bit comfier. And so it's nice to see you all here and hopefully we'll see, uh, some of you, uh, later on this week or in another one of our streams. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.